I'm Adam Todd, and welcome to Classroom Dynamics, a teacher podcast. I've always believed that the best way to engage students in a 21st century classroom is to immerse them with the transformative tools that will empower each and every one of them to excel in the world that awaits. My goal is to ignite the spark that propels you and your students in an advanced tomorrow, and your journey into that future starts right now. Dynamics is supported by Logitech. As education continues to evolve, so does Logitech Education, your partner in content creation for the classroom. With Logitech's cutting-edge technology, students not only learn but also become content creators. Whether it's in person or online, Logitech's tools are designed to inspire educators and learners alike. Capture every educational moment in stunning detail and edit, produce, and share your creative journey with ease. Logitech Education, inspiring the next generation of creators. For more, visit Logitech.com slash education, transforming classrooms one innovation at a time. Introducing the Logitech Zone Learn headset, a sleek and sophisticated tool crafted to enhance your learning experience. Designed for adaptability, this cutting edge headset effortlessly transforms any environment into a focused learning zone, be it at home, in a bustling classroom, or on the move. With crystal clear audio and advanced noise canceling technology, the Zone Learn headset tailors a personalized learning space for your undisturbed concentration. Immerse yourself in coursework, language learning, or virtual presentations with confidence. The precision microphone ensures your voice is heard clearly in virtual classes and meetings, adding impact to your presentations and discussions. Logitech Zone Learn, where sleek design meets advanced technology, revolutionizing the way you learn. Elevate your study sessions enhance virtual experiences and embrace the future of education with Logitech. Always connected, always focused, always learning. The Zone Learn headset, your key to success. For over 20 years, Higher Ground has designed functional technology protection, helping students to work or learn anytime, anywhere. I'm Mark, president of Higher Ground, and I want to share with you how you can get a free sample of any of our rugged shells, sleeves, or clear backpacks. Visit hggear.com forward slash sample and use your school's email and address. One thing, don't tell Alex because he'll be stuck with all the paperwork. Request yours and see for yourself how Higher Ground can help save your students and school downtime and money. Just remember, don't tell Alex. Mark, what are all these sample requests filling my inbox? Welcome to Classroom Dynamics, the podcast where we get into the exciting world of technology and education. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Adam Todd, and today we're exploring the crucial strategy of engaging students through real world problems, specifically focusing on the impact of STEM education. Education is ever evolving, and educators must bridge the gap between theory and practice to ensure learning remains relevant and meaningful. One powerful approach to achieving this is through real world problem solving and embracing the main principles of STEM with science science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Add the A for art and you have STEAM, which brings in an artistic flair to the design process. Regardless whether you're incorporating STEM or STEAM into your approach, it not only makes learning more tangible, but also prepares students for the rigors of a 21st century world that awaits them. Today, we're sitting down with Dr. Cassie Quigley and Dr. Danielle Harrow, co-authors of An Educator's Guide to STEAM, a comprehensive resource that looks into the transformative power of integrating science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics in education. Dr. Quigley is the chair of the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Leading and Professor of Science Education at the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Daniel Harrow is the co-director of the Digital Media and Learning Labs and a professor of learning sciences in the College of Education at Clemson University. And they're both here to discuss what STEAM is, how it differs from STEM, and how it can be used to engage students in kindergarten through eighth grade. Today is all about the entry and purpose of STEAM and how teachers can explore the conceptual model to bring a lasting and defining foundation for their students. When we come back, Dr. Cassie Quigley and Dr. Daniel Harrow are here to help you develop a STEAM classroom. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Are you a dedicated educator searching for fresh and engaging resources to inspire your students? Look no further than Highly Motivated on Teachers Pay Teachers. Discover a treasure trove of easy to use lesson plans, vibrant visuals, and interactive activities designed to captivate young minds and ignite their love for learning. Unlock the potential within your classroom with Highly Motivated from differentiated lap books to test prep passages on a multitude of topics. Our wide range of materials cater to most elementary and middle school grade levels. Join the community of passionate teachers who have already transformed their classrooms. Visit Highly Motivated on Teachers Pay Teachers and get ready to inspire, motivate, and empower your students like never before. Highly motivated on Teachers Pay Teachers, where knowledge meets inspiration. Dr. Cassie Quigley serves as the Department Chair and Professor of Science Education within the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Leading at the University of Pittsburgh School of Education and actively empowers in-service teachers, guiding them to enhance their existing practices with a focus on fostering equitable approaches in science education. Her research also looks at the transformative potential of collaborative problem-solving methodologies, serving as a tool to disrupt traditional classroom dynamics. Furthermore, she explores how this approach can specifically promote computational thinking skills, particularly benefiting girls and students of color, and she's the co-author of An Educator's Guide to STEAM. We also have Dr. Danielle Harrow, a professor of learning sciences and the co-director of the Digital Media and Learning Labs in the College of Education at Clemson University. Danny's research and teaching interests focus on helping advance digital media and learning in schools. She studies collaborative problem solving in makerspaces and technology-enabled environments, and how STEAM education can promote equitable learning opportunities for students. It's my pleasure to welcome both of you to Classroom Dynamics. It's awesome to have you on the show. Very excited about today's discussion. Thank you. Great. Yeah, excited to be here. So Dr. Quickly, let's start with you first. I've been asking this question to everyone during our STEM series this month, so I'm really interested on your perspective. The definition of STEM is pretty straightforward, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Of course, if you include the A for uh, art, you have STEAM. But what is your own personal definition of what STEAM is? Yeah, absolutely. So Danny and I really entered this conversation out of working with schools and schools that wanted to expand the notion of STEM to be more inclusive, right? To ensure that all students could participate and be really engaged around it. Um, And so through this work, we really view STEAM not as just the disciplines of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, but instead through a conceptual model that we developed with teachers that focuses on what type of instruction can support this type of transdisciplinary learning through problem solving. So that's the big the big key for, for our work. So for us, what makes transdisciplinarity really important is this focus on, on problem solving because it helps to bridge those disciplines, right? When you think about problem solving in the real world, it uses many more discipline than just one, like science or math, but really kind of incorporates all of them. So an example that might kind of help people visualize this is that a teacher might create a unit around, you know, the appropriate uh, enclosures for zoo animals. You know, maybe the zoo is thinking about, uh, you know, switching up some of their animals. And this was a a real scenario that that Danny and I worked with uh, teachers on. So the math content would be really um, important for, you know, understanding ratios, calculating area or volume, but understanding animal, animal behavior really makes this topic more relevant and would provide a platform for solving this problem for students. The arts could be connected through designing the enclosure, but also considering how the enclosure fits with the aesthetics of the zoo, and also the the type of environment that really is important you know, to, for the animal. History could also be incorporated in this by understanding the roles zoo, zoos have played in, in history, which is really, you know, really pretty fascinating from wars, you know, presidents to policies and laws. And so really, when you think about it this way, it really is the problem bridging the disciplines of STEAM. And so that's really, you know, kind of how we entered into this work. I've never really thought about that, you know, the history of zoos. You think you go to a zoo as a kid or on a class trip, and you never really think there's actual history to that. Yeah, we had we had a really um, fantastic social studies teacher who who really connected that. And, you know, um, there really are a lot of, of times where zoos um, pop up in really important ways, right? So interesting. Um, In chapter five, and this is a good segue into that question that I'm going to ask is in chapter five of your book, you talk about 
valuing the A in STEAM. And, and what you basically just said was, you know, if you really look at it is what's the value in what you're doing. But with that said, how can teachers put more value in the A? Because you, you mentioned it as being the backbone of problem solving. Why is that so important? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of ways that we've seen this done really successfully. And one is really ensuring that it's not an add-on, right? So really making sure that the A is a part of the problem solving. And so that comes in in the design work, right? So it's really thinking about a problem where the A would be highlighted and, and really, um, you know, really explored. So one example that we um, worked with a school that was looking at the way water, you know, was being moved around their city. This was in a flood prone area. And so this was a really relevant problem. And so they actually, you know, looked to some of the other cities and kind of the ways in which um, other cities solve this problem, but in really kind of interesting ways. So for example, the teachers looked at in Spain and Barcelona and how some of the um, aqueducts were designed and really, um, you know, really beautiful, impressive ways of, of moving water. Um, and then out of that really came, you know, Gaudi's Park Guell, which is in Barcelona, which is a really famous park that really was designed around how do we move water from up in one space down into another space that was really arid. But he built all these mosaics. And so as a part of the problem that the teachers had the students design mosaics, right? And really, so art was really threaded throughout that. Another area that we really see, or way that we really see teachers do this is really involving the arts teachers. So Danny and I you know, had the privilege of working with so many incredible arts teachers. And arts teachers do this naturally, right? They have had to, you know, really make sure that their field stays relevant through integration. And so for arts teachers, this is like what they do. This doesn't feel like a stretch to them. And it really is an opportunity to highlight. And in all cases, we've experienced um, where art teachers are excited when they can be part of the, the curriculum that's happening in other, in other classrooms. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I do media arts technology. So I'm doing art on the computer with the kids. I frequently will work with the social studies teacher and our visual arts teacher so that when the kids are working in ancient Rome, we're doing not only regular mosaics with the kids, we're also doing digital mosaics and they absolutely love it. So I love that you bring that in so that everything gets kind of tied in together. That's great. Yeah. So an educator's guide to STEAM is the book that we're talking about today. There's an emphasis on the power of creating, right? So creating and learning, that's that's the bottom line basics for everybody, for every classroom that's out there. Involving the community now brings a whole new aspect into that. Why are these two key points so vital, especially when mentors and experts that are in the field are actually drawn into the classroom? How, how does that play into it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really for us, the community-based approach to STEAM is, is really important because it helps to ensure that the content is relevant and meaningful to the students, right? It also helps uh, students to be part of the problem solving that's happening in their community. And this really, what we've seen is really what engages students. Students get really excited about solving problems in their community. So for example, one of the schools that we worked with was looking at revising and, and changing up their school lunches. And so as a part of this, they met with the person who was actually in charge of choosing the menu options for their school lunches in the district. And she came to the school, she surveyed the students, um, and this gets to, you, you know, your other part of the question around mentors and kind of why, why we see them as, as connection, connecting points. And students learn what types of jobs are out there through these mentors, right? Um, just like the cafeteria example, the students were exposed to a wide variety of decisions of how the factors that go into food choices, right? So what's the caloric intake? What's the price? How's it packaged? How's it cooked, right? So it really opened them up into the complexity of that. But it also provides an opportunity to ask students questions of these decision makers. So it puts them in, in an agency role. And so bringing mentors to classroom is one way that we, we see this um, as being connected. And we always recommend if teachers do this to prepare a list ahead of time of questions for students to ask and kind of have students ready, right, for the different questions. But then also this can be a great opportunity for field trips, which we really, you know, su support as well. We understand that they can be challenging in some, some ways because of logistics and busing, certainly. 
but that's really where you bring in the authenticity of it so that the kids really do get that that connection. It's not just something in a textbook or something they're looking up online. Now it's tangible. There's something out there that's real, right? It's something you could wrap your mind around. Absolutely. And and it's something that the students often draw upon over and over again when they do go on a field trip. It's something they really remember and connect to. I might let Danny, I know the first part of your question around creating, um, you know, really is, is uh, kind of her uh, wheelhouse, but really thinking, you know, we think about students really as creators, right? When we're thinking about uh, technology tools. So Danny, I'll... I'll... Yeah, 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 we do. So uh, a lot of our work in recent years has moved into maker spaces, which makes a lot of sense. So part of the problem solving is certainly to have students experience using both digital and non-digital tools to think about potential solutions. And a lot of uh, STEAM units naturally lend themselves to ill-defined, open-ended questions. And um, as Cassie and I work with teachers and teachers work with students, we talk about the fact that some of the world's most pressing problems and issues are not solved in just one way. There's there's often, you know, many different viewpoints and solutions. And a way to have students really think about and play around with different solutions is through creating something. Again, uh, and, and the other thing, as you were talking a bit about bringing in community members, what Cassie and I have noticed and teachers have reported is that it really opens up kids to thinking about all kinds of jobs and career paths that they may not have considered. Um, so that that is a really a key part of, of having a community member involved in every STEAM unit in some capacity. It's almost like the common thread of really bringing that up to a whole new mm-hmm. level, right? Raising that notch up so high that you really that you really can have a broad uh, feel for it. You could really see what possibilities lie ahead because, you know, look, there's a lot of people that will go to, to you know, go through high school, go through college and still not know because they just, something didn't click yet. Something didn't interest them. And and when you do bring in that expert, you know, that's such a critical, I think it's such a critical role in, in this whole process. Do you agree? I, I do. And I, I'm, I was thinking um, recently, uh, a unit that was STEAM related, but pretty heavily focused on data science that a music teacher implemented with her fifth grade students. And part of that unit, the data science piece was determining what makes a, a song popular. And they brought in a sound engineer. And j- just listening to the questions that the students had and listening to the sound engineer who did some work, he is uh, he, he he works right now as an academic, but did a lot of work on music sound, you know, sound engineering for um, the film industry. And so it was it was clear to me that the kids had not really considered that they would need to know data science. They may need to they they would have to obviously be creative. There was a lot of technology involved. There was a lot of math involved, and so on. So something so, like that. Yeah. So let's get into that, right? The expertise in that. So the expertise lies with with what you've always done between the intersection of education and technology, and it's kind of similar to what I I do you know I'm I'm bringing I'm bridging you know educational you know aspects to technology for the kids how can educators who are listening effectively integrate technology into their STEAM lessons to not only enhance learning outcomes, but to also promote positive classroom interactions between one another. And why is this so important in a 21st century classroom, which then really does translate into a 21st century world? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, so we, we, we know that technology is pervasive in the lives of youth and adults. A really simple answer to the last part of your question is that children and young adults need to practice positive interactions with technology. Um, As you mentioned, our modern world relies on technology for efficiency and creating and producing and a network sharing of ideas and certainly for innovation. I would ask uh, listeners to consider that the T in STEAM is what fuels innovation and creativity, which isn't to say that low tech or no tech STEAM activities shouldn't be considered and used. We actually see the most engaging STEAM units offering students opportunities to build something offline and then using digital tools when it makes the work more efficient or collaborative, creative, or, or interesting. Um, in terms that's, of- in- that's, that's interesting, almost like a backwards design it, effect, right, to that? It, it is. And so again, we always talk about not using technology for the sake of just using technology. Right. Um, but But in terms of engaging kids- So some things that educators can do, and and many are probably already doing, is incorporating technologies that have kids design prototypes. Um, So for example, we worked with with teachers who had students create light-up creatures in a STEAM unit that explored bioluminescence in some of the activities. So they were using um, circuitry. Uh, We've also seen students create video games 
in a unit where the kids were researching and presenting obstacles and threats to sea animals like pollution and climate change and overfishing. This was all part of their video game. We've seen students using ozobots or spheral robots to mimic the actions of, of animals that they're studying in a particular STEAM unit. Um, and, and I think one of the, the things that Cassie and I saw several years back that was so interesting because it was in a first grade classroom was a teacher who had her students build a physical model on the floor, on the classroom floor, of some of the new industries. This was around a pretty large city in this, this developing city. And the kids had these robots visiting different locations in their classroom and, and performing some actions to mimic or sim- symbolize the, uh, the impact of the development. And of course, there's all kinds of simple tools, which are important, like Padlet or Google Draw or apps that can encourage kids to share ideas. Um, but again, we, we observed and the teachers and students confirmed that the interactions with these technologies were productive and positive. And I would circle back to what you said in the beginning. These are all great practices, or this is a great practice that aligns closely with real world in-demand skills. It's funny. You mentioned a lot of things that I use. I love, and the kids absolutely love the Sphero robot. They love coding that. They, it's just, they get such a kick out of it. They were on one of our past um, episodes. So if you haven't heard that one, go back and find that one. If you're listening to uh, to what uh, Danny's saying about the Sphero robots, they love the Sphero robots. This next question really is for either one of you or both of you, if you want. In part two of your book, um, An Educator's Guide to STEAM, which talks about uh, circular design and and components and how STEAM-like projects typically fall short of what STEAM really is. I know we touched upon it a moment ago, but can you expand on that exactly of what the difference would be? Sure, I'll, I'll start and Cassie may have some things to add. So what we've seen over the last decade plus are several STEAM-focused schools or curricular units that equate STEAM only with robotics or coding or there's a specific focus on a discipline, just one discipline, where the A, the arts and humanistic side of STEAM, is pretty much relegated to making a poster or integrating another discipline um, as an afterthought. So we understand this because early on, many educators were really struggling how to conceptualize STEAM and integrate STEAM education in their everyday curriculum. Um, pacing and standardized testing, sometimes a lack of time or professional development, left a lot of schools or after school clubs to rely on their best idea about what STEAM was or is. And, and a lot of the resulting activities or projects in our estimation were generally good. They were fun, they were engaging, they were educative, but they weren't that much different than a really great coding, robotics, or discipline-focused activity might be. So as Cassie mentioned uh, at the beginning of this talk, our discussion this afternoon, STEAM curriculum should be designed to pose an interesting, relevant problem to kids that naturally requires several integrated disciplines to solve um, the problem. And the problem should involve a humanistic and ideally an artistic approach. Um, A quick example. So students might solve a problem related to clean drinking water in their local community, which is a humanistic real problem in many communities. And as they start posing solutions, they might design vessels out of uh, gourds or clay that are similar to what people used used to carry water in before metal, glass and plastic, you know, was was in vogue. Um, And then they might also create some modern day filters to reuse water with some sort of 3D modeling software. If the teacher and the kids really wanted to take the project a little farther, they might brand their creation and market it using a digital tool like Canva or something similar. So this sort of project helps students make connections between the disciplines. It also addresses creativity and it's a real world, more humanistic approach to solving problems. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would um, add is sometimes we also see people just kind of doing the the disciplines all individually. So science, technology, engineering, arts, and math very separately, which of course then sort of leaves out that, you know, real connection and opportunities to engage students in, in their community and making it really relevant to their lives. The other things we thing we see is that sometimes um, teachers will sh- try to shove in an extra discipline, so kind of forcing a discipline. Um, and what we see over and over again when that happens is that students immediately pick up on that and feel like, okay, no, this isn't actually STEAM. This now feels like school. An example mm-hmm. might be that if if they're sort of if teachers are sort of requiring the students to do a particular type of math math lesson in order to kind of cover math as part of STEAM, instead of just deciding, you know what, this this uh, 
problem could be solved in this case without math. Um, and so we really just um, encourage teachers to, you know, before they're um, finalizing their rubric to see if any of it, any of that sort of shoving in the disciplines is happening. Square peg round hole, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're talking with Cassie Quigley and Danny Harrow today, co-authors of An Educator's Guide to STEAM today. Uh, for you, Dr. Quigley, you've explored the concept of moments of impact in education. I, When I read this in the book, I loved it. Tell our listeners a little bit more about what a moment of impact is and how can teachers create and really take advantage of these moments, you know, within the STEAM framework, just not only to inspire students, but to also build confidence and, and even positively shape their experience overall with a STEAM lesson or project itself? Yeah, we, we think about this in a couple ways. One is that, you know, our biggest hurdle is, is just having the, making sure that teachers, uh, we get to the teachers to try to do STEAM education. And really, that's because the students are so engaged around um, STEAM education that as soon as a teacher is willing to try it and they see how engaged the students are, they're they're willing to kind of work through some of the other challenges that, that do pop up, right? Pacing is, is often a first major challenge for teachers to figure out. Teachers, are, you know, the units might be too long, right? So easy sort of things to fix. But the other thing is really that we we think about offering one to three STEAM units a year. And the while that might not seem like a lot at first, we also like to think about this as the career, you know, the school career for students. So if a student experiences a number of units across their K-8 experience, that's really impactful, right? If they have this right. highly engaged moment around STEAM education one to three times a year over the life of their K-8 um, experience, that can be, you know, quite incredible. Um, the other thing when we think about this from the teacher standpoint is, you know, uh, we understand that new instructional approaches can be challenging. So starting with what they already do, right? So sort of breaking apart the STEAM conceptual model and thinking about what they, they already do. Many teachers incorporate student choice, right, in that. Many teachers are, you know, having students work collaboratively around certain things, or some might be really integrating technology, right? So starting with what they're comfortable with and then sort of stepping in into to steam in a in a really sort of sequential way and this of course for our our um you know principals listening this is something that's really important to support teachers through and an instructional coach right can be really meaningful to to help them think through these strategies i love the way you put it too because it's true over the span of those 9 years that really can make an impact and that really could drive you know kids to go into that field especially girls right who always seem to not want to do this or it doesn't always fit for them even though lately more and more girls are getting into it but i think that's a great great point to look at it and how to and, and how to view it you know put your your feet in those shoes is a totally different outlook yeah absolutely uh, did you want to say something danny or um oh, i was just going to add that um it does get overwhelming if if students feel like they're continually finishing a project and starting another project that's a great point so there, there you know there's a way to make this really appealing exciting engaging if it's not all steam all of the time. Right. Because you don't want to turn them off to it then because then you're defeating the purpose, right? As technology evolves, let's stay on this topic, you know, it, and it does so. It, it moves very fast. I think if you look in the last five years alone, you would be like, wow, you know, like look what's happened in the last five years. What could possibly be in the next five years? With that said, how can educators stay current with all that's available to them? And there's so much, there's so many technological advancements. You have artificial intelligence, there's computer science, science now and to also maintain that dynamic and future ready classroom environment like we've been talking about. You know, I say this because teachers can feel overwhelmed. They can feel bombarded. There's a lot at their fingertips, a lot of ed tech materials they can go to, a lot of ed tech ways and roads that they can go down. How do you kind of pick and choose which ones are the ones that work? You know, the latest and greatest may not always be the mm. best. How do teachers sift through all of that effectively? Mm. That's, a, that's a really great question. And I, I get asked that fairly often. Um, so I, I do think some of it is you have to do a little bit of sifting and paying attention to, uh, to, to what is, you know, to staying current in general, what makes sense for your classroom. Um, but I, I would suggest several things. Certainly, um, educators need to think about engaging in professional development, and it could be attending workshops or conferences that they're interested in. Uh, as, as we know, when we go to conferences, you don't just get a sense of what's coming, what's happening currently. The future is, but you get a sense of how it might play out in some of the early adopters' classrooms or spaces. 
Educators might enroll in online courses. They don't have time for that. They could certainly take a webinar. Webinar Micro-credentials are becoming more and more popular. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from teachers is collaborating with other educators or students in after-school groups uh, where there is less of a, an emphasis on necessarily meeting standards and sometimes and pacing and sometimes a little bit more time to play um, gives teachers inspiration. Um, in terms of AI, they could simply explore some AI tools and platforms and experiment with integrating some AI in their classrooms with students if it's developmentally appropriate. Um, students often take an interest in coding and AI, and educators could offer, for example, a hands-on project using a site like Google's Teachable Machine. I'm a big fan of Google's Teachable Machine to think about uh, creating your own machine learning model. Um, so they could create this model and invite community members to try the AI that they've created. If you haven't heard of it, if you haven't used it, it's it's uh, it's got a, a pretty easy entry into thinking about how to create an algorithm. Um, I, as you can tell, I'm a big proponent of student exploration with some teacher facilitation. I would also suggest that they that they stay informed by following sites like Edutopia, who breaks down some of the, the language that seems difficult with technology into something that seems very accessible, or um, look at Common Sense Media, or ISTE, the International Society of Technology and Education, offers so many helpful blogs. There's also research papers, if educators are inclined to look at those. There's videos, there's teaching examples. And then um, finally, I think if it's, if it's possible, school districts can work with local tech schools or university outreach centers to have AI and computer science students or faculty work with their classrooms for, for short periods of time. What great ideas. So all you teachers that are listening now, you just were thrown like what? 10 amazing ideas to run with. So uh, thank you. That was a great answer. I love that. that, that and it's true. You know, there's, there really is a lot. It's nice when someone ha who has used it can actually say, look, this is what I've used. It works. This is great. This is something you can take from it. So I appreciate that answer. I'm sure a lot of other teachers appreciate that answer too. So let me ask you this now. I mean, we have to talk about assessment. I, I think everyone, when you hear the word, whether you're a teacher or you're a student, you probably cringe a little bit. You know, you get a little tingle up your spine, but it's a, it's a crucial aspect of education, and you do address it in the book. How do teachers effectively assess student learning in that kind of STEAM-focused classroom? Because you could have, you know, it's bustling. There's a lot going on. There's research. There's, there's you know, you know, guess and checking going on. There's building possibly going on. There's some, like you said, some coding going on. So how do they approach that so that that teaching environment not only becomes adaptive, but also meaningful for them? Well, I can start um, by, by saying that assessment should certainly be part of the learning Learning process. And Cassie and I spent a lot of time with teachers thinking about what made sense in a STEAM unit and how teachers could assess particular standards if, if they needed to. Um, but in, in terms of having kids be a part of, of this learning process, we think that very young students also need agency to help identify their learning goals. It can be guided by the teacher. Students should be monitoring their progress in a STEAM unit. Again, very developmentally appropriate. It might be using um, emojis as, as part of monitoring if they've met a particular goal that they have. Kids need some experience providing peer feedback, which has to be modeled. That can be part of the formative assessment process. They should also receive instructor feedback to iterate or change their ideas and products or practice demonstrating something that they think that they know with some feedback. We uh, believe that short formative assessments during lessons work really well to assess daily progress uh, and underlying skills. The formative assessments might be an exit tickets, which a lot of teachers already use, quick share outs, short answers. It could be a quiz, depending on what it is you want to ensure that your, your students understand or need some more time with. Uh, it could be a digital check-in that involves images or videos that the kids respond to. We've also had a number of teachers observe student groups while they're working using a checklist aligned to a rubric that I'll talk about in just a second, a rubric of competencies. In our book, we provided ideas about how to develop non-traditional summative assessments that align closely with the problem to be solved. So in terms of building in assessments, we suggest working backwards by creating, as I just mentioned, 
a non-traditional or summative assessment that asks the kids to showcase or demonstrate all of the learning in the STEAM unit through some kind of presentation. It could be a very short presentation with artifacts, something that they've built or created, um, if it makes sense to do so. And then we have the teachers create a rubric for the teachers themselves and sometimes for the kids to see, along with the checklist of the skills that they're responsible for. So it tends to be a non-traditional summative assessment that's in the form of a rubric something a little simpler for the kids to see, very much aligned with that rubric, and then a checklist. Uh, The checklist then could guide the activities that are built out in the STEAM unit in a little bit more detail, and then educators can note when they're teaching the skill or having the kids practice a particular skill with these embedded formative assessments. So for us, a quick rule of thumb is that you'll likely want to do a check-in every two, maybe three, but usually two days throughout the STEAM unit. And and in our book, we've shared some resources that include examples of how teachers might approach this. That's great advice. I, I, as being an out-of-classroom teacher, I love to do the tag where I I ask them to tell a partner or a small group, if they're working in a group, tell them something about what they're noticing to ask a question. That's the A and the G for tag to give some feedback. So I love that you even mentioned that student to student, you know, just communication, just talking for a couple of minutes. And sometimes when you listen in, you really, as a teacher, you can gain a lot of insight as to what's going on in that group. It's true. Yeah. And I just wanted to add a little bit about, um, as Danny mentioned, the non-traditional summative assessment, this often shows up in some sort of way of um, presenting, right? So we are big believers that, uh, you know, students should share what they know. This can come in a wide variety of ways of presenting though, of course, recording it ahead of time, sort of really working on refining and editing, which also can help students who are a little nervous about public speaking, right? Uh, But one of the things that we want, we focus on is that uh, with presenting, that um, all students should be heard, but not everybody needs to hear all students, right? And this kind of avoids that, you know, litany of presentations after presentation, right? And that sort of burnout that can happen. It's a good point because a lot of times you'll stop listening, right? Especially a kid. Think about a kid, right? After after a couple of minutes, they're not, that's it. They're done. Yeah. So we, we think about, you know, perhaps they record the presentations and a few students or a panel of experts, you know, listens to it and provides f- feedback. And of course, again, this is helping to model that real world um, aspect and and really teaching students how to give feedback, right, should be as much a part of, of the process as it is refining that that presentation skill, as Danny mentioned, right? And, and if you're starting with them really young, right, you know, first and second grade, giving pretty simple feedback, by the time they're um, in upper middle school, it can be really pretty incredible and nuanced. So students do pick up on this. It just needs to be modeled, right? Modeled and supported. That's great points. Great points. In, in 30 seconds or less for both of you, what mm-hmm. do you what do you foresee the future of STEAM to be in the years to come? Well, I think it will likely uh, shift with the pressing, the pressing issues and problems that will need to be solved. It will also be dependent on the types of technology that emerge think we'll probably see a little stronger focus on social and emotional learning for students when engaging in STEAM problems. And in, in terms of teachers quickly, there's we already know there's several thousand trained STEAM teachers in the United States. I would anticipate that that number will increase if schools and communities still believe that that STEAM education is important. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Cassie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, along the same lines as Danny, but I also think, you know, as this becomes more commonplace, what you'll see is, and, and what we hope, right, is that this will, you know, be a little more threaded into the curriculum. So maybe, we, you know, maybe this is a hope uh, that we would, wouldn't see so much the separate um, disciplines, but we would start to see a, uh, more integration throughout the day. Mm, that's true. Uh, this has been really a fascinating conversation, really great deep dive into STEAM learning and, and a great starting point for a lot of schools or teachers who may want to start. They just really didn't know how. I think you guys provided uh, a tremendous amount of starting points and entry points for them. So I, I appreciate it. And I thank you. Um, before we go, tell everyone where, uh, where they can go to find out more about your book and and more just about STEAM education in general. Yeah, absolutely. It's available for purchase on the Teachers College Press website and of course um, on Amazon. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was 
great conversation. I loved it. For those of you who have been listening, thank you for tuning in today and make sure that you share what you've learned or any takeaways or reflections that you've had. And of course, tag us on Twitter at Class Dynamics or Instagram at Classroom Dynamics Podcast. We always look forward to hearing your thoughts on our episodes and sharing the different ways in which you've, you're using what you've learned. Um, you can also help support Classroom Dynamics with as little as $3 a month at Classroom Dynamics podcast.buzzsprout.com. I'd like to thank Dr. Cassie Quigley and Danny Harrow for joining us today on Classroom Dynamics. And of course, be sure to pick up a copy of their book, An Educator's Guide to Steam, wherever you shop for your books. It's a great handbook. You'll love it. It's a great starting point. Uh, again, it's been uh, it's such a pleasure having both of you on with us today. So thank you again for the time and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Classroom Dynamics, where knowledge and inspiration meets innovation. I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion and found it both insightful and uplifting. As always, my goal is to provide you with practical strategies, engaging stories, and powerful insights that can fuel your motivation as an educator. I believe that when knowledge and inspiration do come together, incredible things can happen in your classroom. And for all of you who may feel that it's too late to strengthen your craft, I challenge you to make it your mission to do so. You've worked hard to get to where you are today, and it's never too late to infuse new life into your work. So why not make today that day to do so? I'm Adam Todd, and you've been listening to Classroom Dynamics, a teacher podcast. You can follow Classroom Dynamics on X at Class Dynamics or on Instagram at Classroom Dynamics Podcast. If you haven't already, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And if you know a teacher who may benefit from today's show, please share it with them. We'll be back soon with more captivating conversations, inspiring stories, and strategies that you can implement into your everyday routines. Until then, keep igniting that spark in your classroom and never stop believing in the incredible impact you have as an educator. You're more powerful and inspirational than you think. If you love this episode, you're going to enjoy my conversation with Elaine Atherton of the Scratch Foundation. Whether you're familiar with Scratch or not, this is the coding episode for you. With her profound insights into creative learning and technology, Elaine has been at the forefront of revolutionizing the classroom experience through initiatives like Scratch, inspiring countless educators to integrate coding and computational thinking into their curriculum. How do we think of... Um... AI and how we integrate it and think of it with Scratch in a, uh, as it aligns to expressiveness as well as convenience, um, looking at the possibilities, um, not necessarily running away from this is, we don't want to do this, we don't want it to um, be a part of the process. AI, especially in regards to image generation, it doesn't replace the creative process. We actually need to think about how to make it part of the creative process. Um, it's going to happen.